when people wonder or ask, her, well, why you got to be so violent or wise? Because it, this is what's going to happen to you if you're not. This is the type of, this is the nature of the life that you have to live in prison. But like I say, a lot of people don't understand that and they don't know that because a lot of times when people in there, it's like a, it's like a microcosm, it's like a smaller world. People is living inside of that world and they living under these rules and regulations because this is what governs this world. And then you don't tell your people on the street this, you don't let them know that through visits or through telephone or, or through mail because you don't want them worried about you because if they knew, they would be worried about you and they probably be justified in worrying about you because your life is literally on the line every day because that's the type of stuff that happens. Thank you, how you doing today? I'm doing great, man, how you doing? Doing good, it's a pleasure to get a chance to see you again. This is the third sit down video that we're doing with you. And people have been really enjoying getting a chance to know you. I'm sure you've been seeing some of that. And, you know, what's it mean to see total strangers, essentially, offering support and encouragement for you after everything that you've been through? I think it's beautiful, man. It's, it's beautiful and it's, it's humbling to, you know, receive that type of love, man, and that type of support. Because a lot of times when you're going through what you're going through, you you feel like you're just going through it by yourself. And even though I came through it, to be able to share that experience with people and for have them understand and not to be so judgmental, but to understand, you know what I'm saying, that I had to grow as a man to become the man I am today. That's, that's a humbling and beautiful thing, man. So I respect that and I appreciate everybody out there who has something positive to say about me. I appreciate all the love. You know, as we get into this, one thing that I want to ask pretty much from the onset of this is there's been some confusion in the comments of people thinking that you were somebody else. Yeah. Uh, there was a name that was mentioned, and at first I didn't even think that it was a real name, but after doing a little bit of research, you know, this is a real person, a guy by the name of Tyson Xavier Golden, who people are thinking, you're that man. Uh, yeah, I've heard about that. I, I haven't uh, read a lot of the comments, but I have people who know me who have read them and told me this type of stuff. But uh, I can assure you that ain't me. You know, I don't know this guy. I never met him. You know, never even heard about him until somebody told me about him. Uh, where he's from and the things he's done don't apply to me. I've never even been to that part of the place where they say he's from. Whoever out there who may think that's me, I can assure you that's not me, you know, it's not my story. And at first I thought it was a troll, you know, somebody just trying to stir the pot a little bit. But like I said, after doing the research, there were some similarities between him and the amount of time that he did and you. He did 33 years as well, just made parole not too long ago, but it's just a similarity is yeah. all it is. You guys just had a similar situation to a certain degree. He just had a lot more heinous charges, and this is not you. I want to right. say this as well. You know, I know your full government name, and it is not Tyson Xavier Golden, and I wanted to just clear, you know, clear that up. Yeah, I'm glad you did because, like I say, I my people had told me about it. They wanted me to address it, but like I say, this is like in prison. Certain things, if it don't apply to you, you just don't even speak on it. But you know, being that I'm being asked and you ask me, I'll let you know that that's definitely not me. You know, but I don't know him, don't know his story. I ain't got nothing to do with him. I'm not gonna judge him. You know, first time I heard his name, like I said, was when they told me that, but it's definitely not me. So whoever out there that think it's me, you mistaken. And real quick, one final thing before we move on. You know, in the past, working with individuals, sharing their story, I've put people's names out there, their full names out there. In your particular case, I decided not to do that. I went with your nickname. I wanted to protect your privacy. We've had issues with privacy in the past. And, you know, for anybody who may think I'm just not putting your name out there because it's somehow associated with this uh, other name, that's not the case at all. I've got the proof. Banky, you know who you are. And that's it. I appreciate you helping me to clear that up. No problem. No problem. 
like I said, I was, I mean, you know, I'm new out here, so I guess uh, I'm a little green in the situation. I was under, I was under the impression if everybody knew his real name, they could just look him up and you could see him. If you could see a picture of him, you could see he's not me. I don't even know what he looked like, but I'm assuming people could do that. But I guess it's more difficult than, you know, just, For whatever uh, reason, there's no yeah. picture of this man. So uh, neither here nor there. I want to go ahead and move on. In this video, Banky, I want to focus on some of the more crazy things that you experienced and witnessed throughout the 33 years in prison that you served. Off camera, you shared with me two really crazy stories that I want to key in on in this video. Uh, the first took place on a transport bus ride between prisons, and another one actually took place at a prison that I served time at, a place called Mecklenburg. Which incident would take place prior, the bus ride or, or your time at Mecklenburg? First incident was Mecklenburg, I believe, because, yeah, I was at Mecklenburg. This last incident, the bus ride incident, where uh, the dude died, that was recently. That was within, uh, two, that was in two, 2009. That was in 2009. The Mecklenburg incident, is a couple of incidents at Mecklenburg. Uh, the one that I shared with you, I believe you was talking about when they, they put the knife on me in my cell. Right. Yeah, that was, that was the uh, earlier incident because that was like in 93, 92. And that reminds me of what you've shared. Mecklenburg is where you went to after the stabbing incident yeah. took place at yeah. Augusta, correct? Right, right. You know, let's talk. Let's start with you in the hole and getting transferred to Mecklenburg. The stabbing incident. I stayed back in the hole for probably about 18 months, and they kept trying to transfer me and they ended up could not transfer me. <clears throat> and I ended up getting back out on that institution. And I wasn't out there long, maybe two months, and I ended up in another incident. And the funny thing about that is when you, when you get into a, a violent confrontation like that, and you go in the hole, or even if you go in the hole and come out on another institution, you be like super paranoid, you know, and especially if you come out on the same institution, you super paranoid because you don't know who out there. You don't know if he got friends out there. You don't know if people like him or he got relatives out there that you may have to deal with. And you and you don't know they're there. You won't know until they strike. So it makes you real paranoid. So I think part of that paranoia that I had coming out there after an incident like that and some other things that had transpired, I ended up getting in an altercation with another dude. He had a knife and I had a, I didn't have a knife at the time because I was just coming out. And I had a, I grabbed a mop ringer. I had a mop ringer that we used to, to ring out the mops and stuff. It's a big plastic thing with a little steel and stuff on it. So I used the mop ringer to defend myself and um, I ended up, you know, breaking his collarbone with the mop ringer. And that incident right there got me locked back up in the hole. I ended up going back in the hole and then they was, I guess they was feeling like they washing their hands with me. And that's how I ended up on Mecklenburg. I went to Mecklenburg with those incidents on me. So they was kind of like hesitant to let me out on the yard, you know, because they was feeling like I just had two violent incidents within a couple of years. So they felt like I may be, you know, just that type of guy. But this institution was filled with those type of guys because that's why they send you there. So they kept me in a hole for a while and I ended up getting out. But the incident that I told you about was later on after I had been on there now for a while, I stayed on there for a while. I got there, I think, like maybe, I might have been there two, two and a half years. And this was like 92 or 93. And I was uh, involved with a dude up there, man, that uh, I had met in the hole. and. And uh, coincidentally, I was in the hole for fighting. And he had came up there from another institution and he knew somebody that I knew. So we got to chatting and talking in the hole. And we got all right, cool or whatnot. And he got out and he ended up being in the block that I was in. And uh, in prison, man, uh, I mean, I guess everybody out here knows that, you know, drugs is a big part of prison as well. He, he had a way to get drugs, you know, especially weed. So, 
he used to get the weed. He got out. He got the weed, but he was he was a white guy. He was kind of you know what I'm saying young, and he was he was kind of scary. But he had access to get weed. So if he got access to get weed, that's something that everybody wants. So that's a commodity. So everybody would try to get around him just because they can reap the benefits of him getting the weed. But being that I had met him back there in the hole, you know, he got to messing with me, and all he wanted me to do was to make sure ain't nobody mess with him. And for that, and trade off, I would get money from the weed, which was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So it was a a, a great relationship for me because I was able to reap that benefits. And when you getting them type of that type of money while you in prison, that's life changing money. That helps you eat. That helps you get away from a lot of drama that helps you to subside from some of the worries you're going through because you, you got this little comfort. I was doing that for him, man. I was, I was the one that was making sure ain't nobody messed with him and in turn he was giving me the weed. So you had a lot of dudes on there that was jealous about that at the time because I don't do drugs. I don't do drugs at all. So, but a lot of dudes smoke weed, so they want that because that will enable them to smoke for free. So a lot of guys was coming at him and trying to get at him and he was scared, but I let him know that, you know what I'm saying, when nobody's gonna mess with him and when nobody's gonna strong arm him for anything because I was gonna, you know what I'm saying, make sure of that. So that caused me a lot of problems with different dudes, a lot of conflicts, but I was willing to do that because that's what I had to do to do what I was doing. In order to get something, you had to go through something, so that was what I was willing to go through. And at the time, in my mind, it didn't matter. If it came down to violence, it came down to violence, but you know, that was the situation, so that's the way I was living. And in an effort to try to get rid of me, because dudes really ain't want to confront me head on, they resorted to, you know, sneaky tactics, like trying to tell the people that I'm getting drugs in so the people would keep on coming, taking my cell down, locking me up, putting me under investigation, checking my visitors and doing all these things. But all of that was taxes just to get rid of me because they wanted to leave him out there and get rid of me. But, you know, I like I locked up a couple of times, but when you go on investigation, it's only a couple of days or, or something like that, or maybe a week or two. And when they find nothing that can, you know, hold you back there or substantiate what they're saying, then you can get out. So I was getting back out, but it happened a couple of times. It was getting annoying or whatnot, but I maintained. After that didn't work, I guess they resorted to one day, I guess somebody had snuck in my cell and put a knife in my cell. Now that's serious because they find a knife on you and you own an institution where everybody on there known for violence. That's gonna automatically peak their you know hairs up. They're gonna be you know what's going on. So somebody had obviously went in my cell and did that. I didn't know. I was so paranoid at the time that I thought when they came and shook my cell down and found a knife, I thought the police put it in there. That's how I felt. I felt like they did it because every time they locked me for investigation, they came up empty. So I figured they well, they put this on me so to make sure I get locked up and stay back there. So when I went back there, I had to go on a hunger strike. I went on a hunger strike, meaning I wasn't eating any food at all because I was, I was paranoid. I said, well, if you put a knife in my cell, Y'all might try to poison my food. I didn't know what was going on. So I was I was on a hunger strike. I wasn't eating. And I was scared. I was paranoid. I thought they did it. The warden ended up coming back there and telling me that, you know, his staff didn't do it. Some somebody wrote a note and said I had the knife in my cell and that's what led them to come shake me down and find the knife. He showed me the notes or whatever, but I was still skeptical. I didn't know. You know, like I say, I'm still young, just like 92, 93. I've been in prison since 87, so it's not a whole lot of time that went by. So I, I was still paranoid, but I wouldn't eat. But at the same time, they had Death Row on Mecklenburg, and um, they had a dude that was on Death Row, and, and he was scheduled to die within a week or two. And some type of way, he he got his hands on some, some, some dope, some heroin, and he OD'd and, and took his own life. And that was like big news and they was like super paranoid and when something like that happened now, everybody's job is on the line. The warden's job, assistant warden, whoever run the prison, their job on the line because this is supposed to be the most secure maximum prison in the state of Virginia and death row is the secure of the secure. So how can this man get drugs to OD and he's scheduled to go in the lecture chair in front of the whole world. So it, it was big news. So. My people was calling up there. They was worried about me. They was concerned about me because I was on a hunger strike and they was calling so much 
that it was tying up the lines from them dealing with people that was calling about this death with the OD on death row. So the warden them came back there to me and told me, please eat some food. They actually bought me like McDonald's or Burger King food, one or the other, and try to get me to eat because they was concerned and my people was concerned and calling so much, but I wouldn't eat. And I was still paranoid. He said, well, what do you want? I said, I want to leave. I want to get off the institution. I don't even want to be here because y'all putting knives in me. I said, I don't trust you. I don't want to be here. So he said, well, we can't transfer you like that. You, you just got to eat. Give us time and you eat. And I was like, I ain't eat nothing. You know, I wouldn't eat. I How long did you go on this hunger strike for? I probably didn't eat for maybe about uh, seven, eight days. You know, seven, eight days. And it, it was taking effect on me. I, I was starting to feel it. But... I was sincere that I was I was scared at the time. I didn't know. I didn't really didn't know what they was doing. Later on, in retrospect, I found out that, you know, because like I say, you learn as you go in prison. It's a, it's a learning experience. I found out that some dudes had actually put the knife in my set to get rid of me. But at that time, I wasn't even thinking like that. I was thinking that the police did it. They did it to me. I know from that experience that they can move you anytime they want to move you. Because they came to my cell, man, and told me, they signed these documents. They was going to give me a, a emergency transfer, sign the documents. I signed the documents, and psh, they packed me up, man. And the next day, I was I was in the hole on Greensville. And that was that was how I went to Greensville. That was how I got there, through an emergency transfer within just that, just like that. And that hadn't happened to me in the rest of the time I've been locked up. Everything else is procedure. They go through this, get put in for a transfer. You wait, da-da-da-da-da, whatever. It may take months sometimes. Happened just like that. So I know it can be done, but I hadn't seen it done since. But uh, yeah, that's how I ended up leaving, man, on some trickery stuff. That's part of the nature of prison. The treachery and the, and, and the, and the cunningness and the, and the outthinking. People, people would do whatever they have to do to survive. They would do whatever they have to do to get you out of the way if they need, if they feel you in the way. And at the time, I guess they felt like I was in the way, so they got me out of the way. You learn those type of things as you go on and go on. And once I learned a lesson in prison, I never forget a lesson. So you may can get me with something when I was green, or you may can get me with something one time, but you'll never get me with the same thing twice. You know, and that's how I ended up leaving. I want to bring up a few things from when you shared the story with me, and just things for people to key in on. You had met this guy that you guys were selling weed together back in the hole. Young white guy, he was scared to be at Mecklenburg. He was coming from what, like a level one, right? Yeah, he came from a, a level one institution. To my understanding, what I believe, I think he got caught with like an ounce of cocaine on a level one. And um, that's that's a lot, you know. And uh, I think he ended up getting like 20 years. But on a level one, you, you, you're you basically getting ready to go home or close to it. So I guess, he, like I say, he was doing this thing on there, and I guess he was making so much money that he was taking those type of risks, and it didn't pay off. He got caught. He got caught and got 20 years? He got 20 years. He got 20 years. He, he, it may have been 20-something, but I knew it was 20 or better. So you meet this guy who's at Mecklenburg with you, and you're meeting him. You're both getting there around the same time or something along those lines. But Mecklenburg back then was a notorious prison that housed death row and everybody who was on population was some sort of a notoriously violent prisoner who had committed violence in prison. The criteria to get to Mecklenburg back then was death row, which you definitely ain't want to be, or you had to have been what they considered to be out of control in the system. You had either stabbed somebody, you had either stabbed an a, a officer or an inmate, or you had even created some type of violence towards staff, or you had caught like a major case, like an uh, ounce of cocaine or something like that. But the, the, the top percentage of everybody on there was either there because of some type of violence. They'd even stab somebody. And some of them, was there, it was a few of them there, two or three of them, they had murder charges in the system. They had killed somebody on the street, then came into prison and killed somebody in prison. And when you meet this guy, you know, he was scared to come out of the hole. He didn't want to come out of the hole. Because of those reasons. He know what's out there. But you got to talking with him and found out that he could get the weed in, and you knew this was a hell of a hustle, and told him, hey, look, you can come out. I'll protect you. And you guys were out there together getting money, and other prisoners found out that he was the plug, basically, 
And here you are trying to protect this dude from a lot of situations which you were sharing with me off camera. And these guys ended up planting a knife in your cell to get rid of you. Absolutely. I made it known after a couple of incidents, dudes had pulled up on him and was saying things to him to the nature of, uh, well, I know you getting that weed. I know you the one that's getting banked that weed. You better give me some too, or I better get some, or woo, woo, woo. And I don't care if you tell him or whatever. So it scared him. He was, he was scared shitless, you know? So he come to me and he telling me like, well, I might go to the hole. I might check in because these dudes is talking about doing this, talking about doing that. And I let them know emphatically, if you rocking with me, ain't nobody doing nothing to you. In order for them to do something to you, they're going to have to do something to me. And in order for them to do something to me, they're going to have to kill me. You know, because when you in that type of life and you in that type of environment, you got to be willing to die because death is always going to be on the table. So if you ain't, if you ain't willing to go all the way, you just might not even be involved with it at all. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's the type of way I was living. Now, by no means did I want to die or no means that I want to kill somebody. But when you in that state of mind that I was in during that time, it didn't even matter. You know what I'm saying? It didn't even matter because you, you felt invincible and you felt like it's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? You, I, I literally felt like it's not going to happen. No one can hurt me. But looking back, that was, that was asinine. That was crazy. But I literally was living that way. And for the type of money that he was getting for me through the weed, I was willing to do whatever. You know what I'm saying? And, and I had confronted the whole yard one time and, and made it emphatically known. If you think he owe you something or you think you're going to take something from him or you think you can get something from him, you ain't. You had to come through me. So anybody who don't like it, you can make a move right now. Cause don't ask him for nothing, cause he ain't got nothing for you. So it was already known. So once they knew that that's how I was coming, then the next move was, to, well, how are we gonna get rid of him? And I guess they, you know, I, I chalked that up to the game. They they outthought me. They outthought me because they they planted the knife on me and got rid of me. I didn't know that. I wasn't that. I wasn't that that. That, that type of sharp at that time. All I knew, like I said in prior videos, is that violence is a universal language. It don't matter how smart you are, how dumb you are, what color you are, they know violence. And I knew, I knew that I could produce violence, so I wasn't thinking on the level that they was thinking. I was playing checkers, they was playing chess at the time. So they all thought me and they put the knife in my cell and they got rid of me. So they was like, I can't come at them this way, but I go at them that way. Lesson learned. Well, I mentioned all of that because I really wanted to decipher how deep this story really was with what was going on in Mecklenburg. But I also asked all of this because, you know, after you got transferred, here you wore the protection for this guy. You know, he was basically left to the wolves after you were uh, back in the hole and ended up getting transferred. Did you ever hear anything about oh, him? Oh, yeah. He went straight to jail. He went straight to jail. <laughs> He, yeah, he went straight to jail. He checked in, you know what I'm saying? When, once I was gone, it was nothing else for him. From what, to my understanding, he stayed back there, though, for maybe, maybe a year. I think he stayed back there a year. And another dude that was on there ended up, kept on talking to him. He, he was known to put, put that work in, meaning that he, he'll use that knife, he'll do whatever. He kept talking to him and telling him, come on out, man, you know, give me... You know what I'm saying? Give me a chance, you know, rock with me. I, I, I'm going to make sure ain't nobody going to mess with you. Same as Bank, woo, woo, woo. And he ended up coming out, and I think he stayed on there with him for like four or five years, you know, after that. And he ended up getting transferred as well himself. He got transferred, the white guy. He got transferred. So, yeah, but that, that's what I heard in retrospect after it was over. But, yeah, I ain't never seen him again. I never ran across him again, never crossed his path again. But I know he in, he's probably still locked up. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, everywhere I heard about him, he was still doing the same thing. He just had, had some people that would always bring him drugs, no matter what. So wherever he went, that was his protection, to get the drugs and somebody going to make sure ain't nobody going to hurt him. He was a small dude, you know what I'm saying? And he wasn't violent of, of any nature, but he didn't want to be, which nobody wants to be, sitting in segregation all your whole bit because you don't, you're too afraid to be out in the population. So he did what worked for him, you know what I'm saying? He came up with a, with a way to make money. And if you can make money in prison, somebody's going to always find a way to make sure you are all right, no matter what. If you can make money, somebody's going to make sure you are all right because everybody in there needs money. You know, I appreciate you sharing that. I know Mecklenburg was definitely a crazy time for you. 
but I want to go ahead and fast forward all the way to what you say 2009 or you know the mid 2000s to this other story that you shared with me completely different from the Mecklenburg situation and you know this happened on a, a transfer bus ride talk to us about where you were coming from where you were going how long this ride was and what exactly took place during this transfer yeah this was 2009 um I was on Sussex too. I was en route going to getting transferred to Wallace Ridge, which is uh, probably the worst prison I've been on ever. You know, it was it was super racist. I'm talking like the roots racist, like back in the day slavery racist. That's just how racist they was up there. But and 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 in going there, we was leaving. Uh, Sussex, and uh, they had a dude that was on some type of medication, man, and uh, he won't he won't try to get transferred. So he 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 was bucking the transfer. So as I had mentioned, I think I mentioned in a prior video that when it's time for you to go, you going. If they had to beat you, strap you down, do whatever, shock you, put the dog, you going. If they say you going, you going. So he was he was bucking and he said he didn't want to go. So so they beat him up and roughed him up or whatnot and. Um, they shackled him up and handcuffed him up, but they put the shackles and the handcuffs on him too tight. And he, they literally like had him hogtied and picked him up and brought him on the bus and just threw him in a, in a chair. He, he eventually fell out of the chair and was laying on the floor. On the ride. On the ride. So this, this, this is a ride, if I'm not mistaken, man, this ride is like a 12, 13 hour ride from Sussex to Wallace Ridge, it's, it's a super long ride. We had to get to a, a, a transfer spot where we stopped and be able to use the restroom and, and, and we changed buses or whatnot. That's how long the ride was. But on the ride, he was laying on the floor, man, and he, was, he, he, he wouldn't talk. He wouldn't talk at all. People was talking to him, asking him, was he all right? Because you got to remember, we handcuffed and shackled as well. And we sitting there and we asking him, is he all right? He won't answer. But his his skin color was changing. His, he was a light-skinned dude anyway, but he, he he was like starting to turn purple. And another dude that mentioned he started to look bloated, like he was just like swelling up. And everybody kept telling the bus driver, man, y'all need to pull over. You need to pull over and, and, and check this dude, this dude laying on the floor. And we going through hills and, and, and down. I mean, he's just sliding all over the floor because we sliding in the chairs. So it, it, it just, it, it was a horrible situation, man, to see that this is a human being being treated like this. That's, that, that, that's a human being. And, and they knew, and they kept saying, well, we can't stop, well, we can't stop. So we drove, man, for hours and hours through hills and mountains and everything with this man laying in the floor like that suffering. And it was, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a horrible situation. So when we get there, we're still telling them the same thing. They're getting us off of the bus and telling us that we got like five minutes to use the bathroom and, and you know, they got guards out there with guns or whatnot. And we tell them, you got to check on do this. Don't worry about him, worry about yourself. So we get off, we use the bathroom. They give us a little bag of meal, you know, a bologna sandwich and orange or whatever. And we get on another bus. They go get him to bring him on the bus, and they th think that he he's he's still bucking or whatever. They scared him because they heard that they had to, to to tussle with him to get him on the bus. So they put a a mask over his head to prevent him from spitting, thinking that he might spit on him. But the man is unconscious. The the man is unresponsive. The man is purple, and y'all still doing this to him. They drag him off of the bus and they bring him to the bus that we own and just pick him up, set him in the front seat like a sack of potatoes. And he stayed there. And we sitting on this bus waiting for them to get their affairs in order so we can leave and you know proceed to, to Wallace Ridge. And while we're waiting to do that, they have some people come and check before we pull off, like a checkpoint. So the major came on there, which is like the third person in charge on an institution. You got the warden, assistant warden, and then the major. The major is usually in charge of security. He, everything that has anything to do with security, is, 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 it falls under him. 
So he came on the bus and he looked at the dude. He said, this is the dude right here that y'all talking about? He's like, yeah. So he spoke to him. He said, hey, hey, the dude didn't respond. He tapped him. He didn't respond. He said, well, before y'all leave, man, I'm just going to get the nurse to look at him before y'all leave. So he leaves and about 10 minutes later, a male nurse come over. He walks up to the dude sitting at the front and he leans over and I guess he touches on his neck. I guess he's trying to find a pulse or something. Well, he don't feel one. He immediately grabs the dude and starts dragging him off the bus, telling the bus driver to help me. Help me get him off. He's not breathing. They take this guy off of the bus, lay him on the concrete floor right beside of us. All of us is looking out at the bus window as if we little kids in grade school looking out at a car accident or something. And he's laid out there, and they done cut his shirt open, and they trying to give him CPR. He's bloated. He's swelled up. He's purple. It's obvious he's dead. So we just looking in awe because they let this man die. They just let him die. And that was, a, that was literally a horrible death. To be on that floor in handcuffs, rolling around like a sack of potatoes for hours on, on end, you know, that was miserable. It was miserable, man. It's an it's a image that stuck in my head, and it was crazy. And, and they, they sitting out there acting like they giving them CPR and and, and uh, all of this stuff, but all of that is just because they know people looking. Now they know we looking, so they just trying to really cover their behinds because we can see this. And then they start getting on the phone and they calling people and we ended up staying there for hours, hours, extra hours, three, four more hours because they got the state troopers there, they got the paramedics there, they got the wardens there, they got everybody there now, but he's been dead for hours. So we sit there and we, we, we stood in that bus and watched that dude lay out there on that concrete for hours and everybody acting like they're trying to save him when they know he been dead. They even put a machine on him that was like doing this CPR thing and, and pushing his lungs in it and had some in his mouth where you wouldn't have to do it manually. And they just kept doing it as if he was going to come back to life. So I just thought that was super crazy, man. And, and, and then when we get there, like I say, you into a, a whole nother world. These people are super racist, man. I mean, like nothing I ever seen like in my real life. It, you know, it's some TV type stuff. So you had to adapt to that. You have to adjust to that because they shoot you up there too. They got they got guns up there. They shoot you for stepping over the line. They shoot you. They sick the dog on you. I mean, it's nothing you can do. So I also had an older guy on the bus with me. Um, he was like in his sixties, man. He was a a little bitty guy, he probably weighed about 110, 115 pounds. And he's in his mid 60s or something. I, if I remember correctly, I think he was like 66 or 67 years old. And um, he was real boisterous though, he'd talk a lot. And, but you could tell it was a little something wrong with him, but he didn't mean no harm. His time would do that to you. It, it, it would destroy your brain if you let it. He had been locked up far as I knew, I think like 30 years, 20, between 28 and 30 some years. And his brain was a little messed up. He, you know, he'd do crazy stuff and say crazy stuff, but you have to, you know, understand who you're dealing with. But um, he he was on that same bus ride as well. And within two, two weeks, two to three weeks of us being there, he uh, he got murdered by his, his, his cell partner. His cell partner murdered him in the cell suffocated him, put a sponge in his throat, and covered him up on his bunk. And uh, that's, it. that's, that's you know, like I say, th these are things that sound crazy, but that was just like real life in there. That was like real life. He, he actually killed the old man because he didn't like him. The old man annoyed him, and he killed him. And it took a couple of days for them to realize he was dead. And the only reason they realized he was dead because it was an odor that started to come from the cell and he had stopped coming out there in the morning to take his medication. So the nurses asked, where was he? So when they go to check on him, that's where they find him. Dead in his bunk with a sponge stuffed down his throat. And uh, that, was, that, was, uh, that was crazy. And I used to, I was telling you, it's, it's a movie and I can't, I, I want to say Final Destination or something, but it's a movie that made me think. I was like, almost, every, it's like seven of us came up there on the bus, and, and within a, a month or two, two of them dead. So it, it just made you like super paranoid, like what was going on, but that was just crazy. That same dude that ended up killing them too, 
he, he ended up killing another person within a year later. You know, I want to jump in right here because I'm reminded of you sharing this with me before off camera. And it was when you mentioned the fact that this guy's cellmate killed somebody else within a year. And then you told me who this was. I had actually done a video about this particular prisoner probably four years ago. One of the most notorious prisoners from this state, a guy by the name of Robert Gleason. And you were locked up with this guy getting transferred to Wallens Ridge uh, with somebody who would end up being his celly who he would actually kill. That's that's the exact same dude. And um I mean, like I say, when when they went to his cell and they found him dead and they brought him out and it was like asking him what happened to him, he said he killed him. It was nonchalant. It's just as easy as you asking somebody, is it raining outside? He said yes or no. He said, Yeah, I killed him. He said, why? He said, I didn't like him. When you see that type of stuff, like I say, you and I see, you see him coming out in a body bag. You see him take him out in a body bag. You see the, the real police come inside of a prison. You see state troopers. You see uh, doctors and stuff come in here to take this dude out. It, it's crazy to you. And this is, this is like I say, this is 2009. I done been in prison now since 87. And the same stuff is still happening. So... When people wonder or ask, say, well, why you got to be so violent or wise? Because it, this is what's going to happen to you if you're not. This is the type of, this is the nature of the life that you have to live in prison. But like I say, a lot of people don't understand that. And they don't know that because a lot of times when people in there, it's like a, it's like a microcosm. It's like a smaller world. People is living inside of that world and they living under these rules and regulations because this is what governs this world. And then you don't tell your people on the street this. You don't let them know that through visits or through telephone or, or through mail because you don't want them worried about you. Because if they knew, they would be worried about you and they probably be justified in worrying about you because your life is literally on the line every day because that's the type of stuff that happens. The incident that I spoke on before when I said about when I, I had the first incident about stabbing somebody, like I said, I, I haven't been able to read all them comments or even uh, barely any because I'm waiting to get some glasses and stuff like that. Plus, I haven't really been in, into knowing how to navigate that, that, that system and stuff yet. But people be telling me about things that have been said on there. And even about the incident when they said about um, the stabbing incident, somebody had told me, they said that, well, one of the comments was, oh, yeah, well, if you stab somebody from the back, you're a coward. Well, uh... <laughs> My response to that is, if you in war, you in war to win. You, you, you're not in war to be fair, you're not, you at war. And when you wait around for, to see if someone's gonna kill you, you probably gonna get killed, you know? And that's just how it is. You don't wait for somebody to come kill you. If you know you got a conflict with somebody, it's up to you to handle it. If that person know he has a conflict with you, he should be prepared to handle it. When people are in conflict in prison, you don't sit around and wait and see what the next man gonna do. That's gonna cost you your life. And I, I would, I would say just the same thing in the jungle. I, I, I have never seen a lion tell a gazelle that he's gonna kill him. Does that make the lion a coward? He's the king of the jungle. He attacks because the gazelle knows not to be in his presence because they know they don't get along. When you beefing with somebody in the prison, you know the same thing. You know you don't get along or you know it's going to be beef. So you going to make a move or he going to make a move. But if you wait for him to make a move, then you're going to die. Or you're going to be having a hole in you or you're going to be walking around with a bag on your side using the bathroom. Or you're going to be walking around with one eye. So when someone threatens me or when somebody try to do something to me or if I think they're going to try to harm me, I'm going to do what I have to do to protect me. Because I only got one me, you know. So if that what constitutes as being a coward, then that's what it is. But I'd rather be a coward and alive than be a brave dead man, you know. So that's that's what I say to that, and that's, that's how we live in prison. You know, you live by your instincts. You live by your feeling. You live by if you think danger is coming, you're going to have to do something. It's just that simple. Because all those who don't wait, that's, that's what happened to them. They get taken out in body bags. I just wanted to say that because in talking about this made me think about when somebody told me that. Which usually, like I say, I told you earlier today, I don't, I don't really worry about what people say because I know who I am and I know what I am. 
You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't try to defend nothing. I just let my life speak for itself. I'm gonna be who I am and you're gonna be able to see who I am. But in order to judge somebody, then you have to be willing to be judged. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what you would do in any situation until you are in that situation. You know, until you are in that situation. But also, self-preservation is the, is the first, first law of nature. You got to be able to take care of yourself. If you can't take care of yourself, then you can't take care of nobody else. You can't do anything. And in, in prison, you don't have to know how to take care of yourself, one way or another. That's something you're going to learn or you're just going to perish in there, period. You know, and I had too many people out here that loved me and was depending on me to get back out here. That's why I did what I had to do to make it back out here, you know, to the people who do love me. And, and, and I'm glad I'm out here. And if I hadn't lived the way I live, I wouldn't be out here. Or if I would be out here, I wouldn't be the, the, the man that I am today. You know, and the man that I am today, I'm proud of.